Mr. James, I have today passed checks presented under the protection of your check card that bring your overdraft to £1,064. We have written to you repeatedly to point out that you have no arrangement to cover this sum. I'm afraid we're no longer able to extend this facility. I must demand the return of your check card. Mr. James, we are no longer prepared to act as your bankers. I'm foreclosing your account. Do you understand? Mr. James, do you have any plans to resolve this situation? Oh, yes. I have a plan. Mr. James? Mr. James? I'm in charge of this investigation. You may well be right there, Sergeant. Right. Another bank manager has been murdered. We hope to have more details before the end God of the program. God's I haven't even seen the body yet, and there's some tit in the press office ringing Radio 4 with a story. Early reports are coming in of the murder of another London bank manager. We hope to bring you the full story on the 6 o'clock news. DCI Jefferson called a scene of crime. So where is he? Where's the bloody crime correspondent? Max, where is George Cragg? What's the problem? Someone's knocked off another bank manager. And the problem? We've got the Chancellor in the radio car to take that statement, Beth. More information on the murder. Victim was manager of Midwest Bank Tooting. No information about links with the other killings. No, I bet there isn't. Not with my crime reporter crawling around somewhere with his head up his trousers. Well, perhaps in the radio car back to Westminster in ten minutes. Oh, for God's sake, Gemma, you're on air at six. I'm walking in the air. On Radio 4, reading the national news. Don't know any news. Neither do I unless George turns up. I expect he's out walking the mean streets. Well, I tell you, if he's not back from the mean streets in the next 20 minutes, he's out. You could try the Yorkshire Grey. Most of George's mean streets lead in that direction. The secretary thought something was wrong when she came in here after lunch and uh, found him like that. Ooh, smart girl. We will be out of a job at this rate. Okay, let's have statements from all the bank staff, including Miss Marple, his assistant, and any customers who came here this morning. What does Tom say? Hit on the head with something chunky, and then the coins were piled up around him. Just for display, apparently. Pound coins, just like Battersea and Hackney. That's right, Guff. And also... Another note? Yep. Dear bank manager, this is to advise you I am compelled to rescind your facility. Blimey. Yeah, I know. Officer. Go and grab us ten Benson and Hedges, would you? Hey. He's got a dust those for prints. Oh, yeah, that should narrow the suspects down to about a million and a half. It's like three in a row, doesn't it, Gov? So the question is... Who wants to go around murdering bank managers? Question is, Sergeant, who doesn't? I mean, where do we start? Ridiculous. It's the last time George does this. I mean, what is the he's playing at? It's a big story. There'll be questions in the house. Jesus, they've got serial killers swarming all over New Britain. And all I've got is a headline. He's a professional. He'll be here. No, he's a professional bloody drunk, Max. And if he's going to be here, he's got... 50 seconds to on air. 50 seconds. 
With me outside the BBC's broadcasting house is Geoffrey Crichton Potter, leader of the Reform Party. What do you see as the main issues in the round of local elections coming up? The public has simply had enough. They voted for change, yet they see no real change at all. Yet again, we have a government with neither the wit nor the will to raise taxes to provide proper public services. A government that has ransomed the welfare of this country to the whim of the Bank of England. The, the voters are sick of it. So what does the Reform Party offer? Um, uh, Mr. Crichton Potter is saying he'll be making major policy statements tomorrow. That's exactly what I'm saying. Oh, but there's a taxi. Oh, cut. Crag! Fifteen seconds. This is ground control, Gemma. The road protest woman's waiting on two. Ten seconds. OK. Lead with the murder stories, trailer full of report, then straight to you on the FTSE Max. Bloody Stand by. George. Five. Three. Can't find anything about Three. it in the Guardian. Two. One. Cue, Gemma. It's six o'clock. The news from the BBC with Gemma White. The miracle to remember. Another London bank manager has been murdered, the third in three weeks. We hope to bring you a full report from our crime correspondent, George Cragg. Later in the programme, the Home Secretary has come under attack over an increase in recorded crime during the first year of Labour right. government. Oh, right out, George. The city welcomes Excuse the me. announcement of a further Thank rise you, sir. in interest rates. Our economics correspondent... Max Parker. The Chancellor was once again accused of having handed control of the economy to the Bank of England after the Governor, Sir Custis Deaf, announced a further one point rise in interest rates. I can do no better than to quote from The, the Guardian. Guardian, which this morning claimed that the Labour government had what it had. Another late lunch, Mr. Cragg. No, Hercules. Been to the dentist. Let me give you a bit of advice. Never go to the dentist when you've had ten Guinness and a chicken vindaloo. The phrase, would you spit that out in here, takes on a whole new meaning. Mr. Craig, as your personnel officer, I have to say this is not appropriate conduct. Bollocks. And this is a strictly no-smoking building. Will you kindly not light that? The Home Secretary yet again reassured consumers that despite the new cases, British beef is quite safe to eat. I'm sorry it seems we won't be able to bring you more details on the bank manager murder at present. Married? Good the job. You! you. Like Where you. the hell have you been? You were due in at eight this morning! Oh dear. Are you looking for me? Should have called my mobile. George, you were sitting on your desk! You are the most useless, idle old hack in the history of the BBC! You're far too young to know. I've really had enough of this. Have you got any idea what's been going on? Press office, please. Hello, it's George. Um, have you got a statement for me on the shooting business? Oh, good, thanks. Uh, hang on, I'll just get a pen. Line two. What name? What are you going to do? Now we return to the news of the murdered bank manager. Our crime correspondent, George Cragg, joins us now with the latest details. The murder of James Addison, manager of the Midwest Bank in Tooting, in his office this lunchtime, is the latest in a series of violent crimes to hit London's banking community. Mr Addison, a single man, was described as a no-nonsense manager by his staff. Scotland Yard issued the following statement. Go ahead. James Addison, a South London bank manager, was found murdered in his office. There may be a link with the two recent murders in Battersea and Hackney. OK. All banks should be vigilant, as it is possible the person responsible may attempt to strike again. At present, police appear to okay. have no further Did clues as to the identity of the killer. No, no, that's fine. Um, George says thank you. ...cannot be ruled out. And now... Bloody George! He only does it so I can't edit him! ...by the Coxless Fours. Some, the members of the review board, found the program sensational, dull, dated, infantile, overproduced, under-edited, pussyfooting, badly scripted, and noisy. 
the head of religious broadcasting, found the sound effects salacious. <laughs> Any response from the controller of Radio 4? No? Have fun with the seven series. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You'll have the pleasure of the Director General's company next week. <laughs> Martin. Controlled anything interesting lately? Quite honestly, Charles, I'm not exactly sure what I'm controller of these days. Come now. Radio 4 is public service broadcasting in its purest form. You mean nobody listens to it, don't you? I know what they say. Audience research users, tracker dogs and so forth. No, what I mean is everybody who is anybody who listens to you. Quite frankly, Charles, most people are nobody. True, which is why I give them Radio 2, of course. Phil Collins, Enya. Herb Alpert and his Tijuana Brass. Not that I listen to my own network, of course. Oh, of course. I mean, I may be controller of radio, too, but I'm a civilised man, for God's sake. But at least you have listeners. I've got more people running my network than tuning into it. They've given me this new team. I've got this woman who manages the morning, somewhere else for the afternoon, a chap for the evening, and a pair for the weekend. Well done. But what am I controlling, exactly? Them, of course. The more people you have doing the job you used to be able to do on your own, the better you're doing. Management is what the BBC does nowadays. Surely you knew that? Yes, it's the DG thing, isn't it? Oh, yes, the DG. Tell me something, Martin. What do you actually think of the DG? Hmm? Well, he's an excellent man, doing an excellent job. Uh, efficiency vision for the digital age is very... Efficient. Oh, quite. If he makes the BBC any more efficient, it'll disappear. Think how much license spares money he could save if we just stopped doing programmes altogether. He's a television man, of course. Born in television, trained in television. I wonder if he'll die in television. Sorry? Tell me, Martin. Do you know how to handle a gun? That's the paperwork. Sorry, mate. You'll have to apply the bailiff and clear what you owe. So? I want to talk to you, George. We had a major crime story and you blew it. I thought I was rather good, actually. You were 15 minutes late to air. You gave us no idea what you had. I had no time to edit it. You made the whole programme ridiculous. You've got no idea what this job's about, have you? Oh, come on, Beth. George the best. He's covered everything. The Yorkshire River, Cromwell Street. The wreck of the Hesperus, yeah, I know. You may not have noticed, George, but since you joined the Beeb, it's turned into a professional news-gathering organisation. And you haven't. Well, what do you expect in a newsroom where the average age is 11 and you have to go and stand in the middle of Oxford Circus to have a fag? I will not have members of staff missing, presumed, pissed! Isn't it near your bedtime, Beth? <laughs> what do you know about modern news management, George? All right. Thanks for rights. I know absolutely nothing about the media studies degree at Leicester Poly, but I have actually been out there doing the job since you were in Pampers. OK, that's it. I'm going to have you in front of a disciplinary hearing, George. Oh, are there still bits of the BBC that give a toss, then? Well, if there aren't, I'll set one up. Hello, George Cragg. I thought you were excellent on PM, George. Oh, good, thank you. Uh, that's the Director General, is it? Would you mind telling my editor here? But you shouldn't leave out the best bits. I'm very proud of my murders. Beth! Who's speaking? I left notes with the bodies, George. You must know that. What notes? What do you know about the murders? Coins and notes. I'm disappointed in you, George. There'll be another soon. I'm counting on a full report. You are the BBC. That's what we pay our license fees for. Look, let's meet. What's your name? Don't be silly, George. Not the Director General in any case. Who was that? You all right? I don't believe it. Apparently I've just talked to the bank manager murderer. Exclusively. Is that all you've got for the 10 o'clock, George? One crank phone call. I'll see you at the disciplinary.
Henry. Uh, can I help? Uh, no, no. Uh, I'm looking for, um... Oh, yeah, yeah, one flight up. She moved it on Monday. Hi, Mr. Inchkey, you found me. I've come about a disciplinary matter. Sure, come in. I see Miss Sin has started her uh, trading. Oh, they never seem to stop. You working late? As usual, CP needs a whole new policy platform by the morning, promised his public on the BBC. Cup of tea? Oh, I'd love a coffee. No, I work experience. I only do tea. Love us a coffee, will you? Uh, new Scotland Yard, Chief Inspector Jefferson, please. I don't know. When we came to the BBC, it was run by grown-ups. I know. What a monster munch. No, thanks. Here he asked the old pros. Oh, it's the Prime Minister's private secretary about the honours list. Now it's a kid with a media diploma who can't hold down a can of hooch. George. Oh, Frank, it's George. Oh, come on, old son. They'll call you one day. Look, I need a lead on these bank murders. Yeah, a bit of exclusive scene of crime stuff or something. Sorry, George. It's one of those tread very carefully jobs. We don't want a lot of copycat attacks and all that nonsense. Oh, dear. No, it's the political thing. The government's gone all touchy, you know. And it's all their traditional weak points, isn't it? Law and order and money and that. They don't like it. Anyway, the Home Office lot are moaning at the Commissioner and he's breathing up my bum. And by the way, I heard you pulled a fast one with my press office on the news. Driven to it, Your Honour. Oh, come on, Frank. Oh, I could always fool with my old sexual harassment in the Met piece. Or I could knock out a mysterious deaths in police custody if there's nothing else doing. You're filthier than the filth, you lot. You know that. Oh, all right. Oh. I can meet you in an hour or so. My place or yours? Make it yours. All right, the Prince Alfred it did. Oh, dear, take it away. The eyeballs are disgusting. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. Okay. How about this? Beware of words, for with words we lie. It's brilliant. Yeah, well, it would be if Auden hadn't said it first. Who? Never mind. How am I supposed to write an outline of a policy platform when we don't have any policies? Oh, well, I suppose I could make them up. No one in this party will ever notice. Crichton Potter doesn't understand economic theory. Doesn't he need to, to be in politics? CP doesn't understand politics either, but he's never let that stop him. So how come he's an MP? Because he's totally unemployable in any other capacity whatsoever. So how come you're his speechwriter? Because I'm totally unemployable in any other capacity whatsoever. How am I supposed to work with that going on? God! There's so high out there, look. Half of London's out there selling it, the other's out on the town looking for it. Oh, you mean the big issue? Oh, yes. Oh. yes, I probably do, Paul. Well, I'm off. I'll tell you what, if I see one, I'll get you a copy. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Oh. Beware of words, for with words we lie. What this country needs now is not words, but passion. Oh, oh, yes! The mounting frustration of the British public will not be denied. <sighs> hey, Frank, get this. You know the new political correspondent we've just got? I think so. Jogs. Oh dear. Truly. Saw him the other day, one o'clock, running up Langham Street in his little Reeboks. What's the world coming to, eh? We're the last of a dying breed, you know. Uh, when they made us, they broke the mold. Oh, faces don't fit. No. Your turn. No, come on, Frank. Tell all. Off the record. Go on, then. Well, it's the same bloke today that did Battersea and Hackney. 
He's got a thing about one pound coins. Leaves them all over the shop. And notes. He leaves notes. Nobody knows that. He does. Bloody hell. I think I talked to him tonight. What do you mean? He rang me up, Frank. Said he was the murderer. He wanted me to report his notes. Do you record it? Oh, we're all digital now. We don't run to tape recorders. Doesn't stop me reporting it, though. No, you don't. If that gets out, I'll have loonies all over the country sending threatening letters to the bank managers, and you'll know it. All right, I'll keep stum. If you uh, show me the notes in question. <sighs> Absolute discretion. My eyes only. Chatham House rules. This was to Mr. Culpepper, who was hacked down in Hackney. Dear bank manager, I'm writing to warn you, your account is being closed forever. You have now reached your expiry date. Mr. Carson, who was battered in Battersea. Dear bank manager, I write to inform you that it is high time you settle your debts in full. Malthus lives, which is more than can be said for you. Usually Elvis, isn't it? You know, like it says in the tube. Elvis lives, so why'd they bury the poor sod? <laughs> Thomas Robert Malthus, early 19th century economist, who believed there were too many people on this planet for it to survive. Must have been to an Oasis concert. That's number three from today. I'm beginning to like this man. He's killed three bank managers. Exactly. It's not as if it's people, is it? He's educated you, man, anyway. Knows something about economics. Fingerprints? Clues? Nothing. All we know is he wrote them on an apple. Doesn't look like an apple. Apple Macintosh, you tosser. This Ponce who called you, what'd he sound like? Oh, disguised voice, very ordinary. I thought it was the Director General. All right, Frank, how about this? I run the coins, but I hold off on the notes and my phone call. You take me on the case, I tip you off if he calls me again. I get to break the story first. What do you reckon? I can live with that. Oh, he said one more thing. There's going to be another soon. Oh, thanks a lot, George. Good of you to mention it. That's prime information, that is. Can I quote you on that? Oh, go on, then. For a double McCallum's. <laughs> Oh, well done. My turn. Tell you who! Oh, damn. What do we do now? Walk around? Uh, no, that's golf, Martin. Look, I don't mind you being a bad shot, but I wish you wouldn't say Tally Ho all the time. It's rather vulgar and doesn't really become the helmsman of Radio 4. Sorry, I'm not really the country type. You leave the vulgarity to my lot with swimming in it. Jimmy Young and Sarah Kennedy. Pull, pull! So, the DG couldn't make it along today. Yeah, well, of course, busy man, the Director General. No time to fraternise with a couple of radio controllers. Oh, no. <laughs> As he said, via his PA, he's uh, tied up with licence fee discussions. Oh. End of memo. Well, he's a money man, the DG. Understandably. Paul! Quite a money man. Naturally, I called his office and said that I understood and that maybe next time. Naturally. But it seems that he'd gone out for a quick game of golf with the director of television. Or maybe it was pitch and putt. Paul! The trouble is, Charles, we don't have television's money or television's clout. Or television's audiences. And television gets the viewers, so television gets the money. It's as simple as that. Well, that's how a money man looks at it. And in the great spreadsheet of the Director General's mind, we're down there amongst the sundry receipts and petty expenses. Nation shall speak ratings unto nation. Paul! Oh! Radio was never about ratings, Charles. It was about sound. Quite public service sound. You can't expect the Director General to understand that. Oh, no. So you can't put it on a website or turn it into a CD wrong. One can see his point. Well, it wouldn't surprise me if there wasn't any radio operation in a few years' time. And there's nothing we can do about it. Paul! Unless, of course... Unless... Unless something were to happen to the Director General. What? Paul! Say, Charles, you're getting to be an extremely good shot. Mm. 
BBC News at 10 o'clock. The so-called bank manager murderer has been revealed to have an obsession with one pound coins. In the hunt for the killer, Chief Inspector Frank Jefferson said last night he was working on crime information supplied by the BBC's crime correspondent, George Crack. The work Crack. was written when their father, Johann Sebastian Bach, was Kapellmeister at You're in a Mexican marketplace. Who else could it be? Herb Alpert and his Tijuana. Cool. Blast. Straight in the charts this week at number 48. It's the Slinky Head with their new song about the serial killings in the red. Take a trip through the midnight city now. Take it to the strippers bar. Smile and cover to your soul. Hold love you the better than you see Ah, Mr. Cragg. You've been through this several times before, so I don't need to explain the procedure. I am Hercules Fortescue, your personnel officer. Uh, with me is a representative of newsroom management, Miss um, Beth Parsons, and an NUJ representative who can speak on your behalf if he so chooses. Oh, come on then, get on with it. It is part of my job to deal with all BBC staff instructions, terms and conditions, regulations, guidelines, directives, prohibitions and codes of practice. I'm surprised you can stand the excitement. George. I have here a list of 15 misdemeanours, major and minor, uh, you have committed over the last year, ranging from quite simple breaches of staff instructions to really quite complex breaches. I'm on the edge of my seat. This disciplinary interview can make one of several recommendations. At your annual personal assessment, we may recommend a negative increase in remuneration. Is that bollocks for a pay cut? We may issue a further official warning. We may recommend your instant termination. I'm sorry, this is a no-smoking building. Will you please put that out? Got an ashtray? No, I've not got an ashtray. It's also a no-drinking building, George. Excuse me, what about the governor's shindigs? I don't notice a lot of teetotal entertaining going on up there. Yeah, what about them? You rolled up entirely uninvited to that do last week, got completely off your face, and managed to throw crim caramel down the dress of the heritage minister. Can't have been old bad then, can it? Peace in early this month. The cotton is high. And a very good morning to my dedicated team. CP, this dedicated team. I was wondering if maybe it's a little bit small. What with the local elections and that. What do you mean? We're up to ten MPs in the Commons. We've got our marvellous chap in the Lords. What? Oh, monotone. Lord Tone. Then we've got our volunteers. There's Paul here. Only if you start paying me. Thank you, Paul. And then we've got you, Henry, our brilliant speechwriter. What else do we need? Well, how about a million pounds in donations, a big shiny building with a huge staff of media experts, and hey, a policy? You've been very negative this morning, Henry. How's my speech to the House? Fine. I thought we could go on the bank manager murders. They could be very useful to us. The bank manager murders? Yeah, it's all over the morning papers. <laughs> I'm party leader. I, I, I haven't time to read the morning papers. Well, I think you should, CP. Just the big oblong ones. This is a major political phenomenon. It's a reaction against greed and inequality. It's a disillusionment with the government. Time for a third party to offer the only real alternative. Oh, Lord, is it? Um, look, um, I'm having lunch at the Savoy Grill today. But it's only 10.30, CP. I know, Henry, but if there's one thing I've learned in a lifetime of politics, it's the importance of having a really good lunch. I really do wish you'd read my speech before you give it. Oh, do I need to? I mean, all your stuff is jolly good. Someone might ask questions, then you'd be off the script. Yeah, uh, well, I suppose I'd better give you the once over. Henry, uh, who is this Malthus? It has been decided it would be of mutual benefit to you and the newsroom if you spent time in a different working environment. Bollocks, Hercules. I'm investigating a major crime story. The nation's hanging on my every word. Tell him he can't do this to me. You are attached for a period of 12 months to the viewers and listeners' correspondence department what? Winger's Corner? You think I'm going to spend my day answering letters about too much sex from people who aren't getting enough? And too much violence from people who clearly benefit from a large dose? Accountability is a keystone of current BBC policy, George. Hello? 
Yes, he is. Hold on. It's for you, George, through the switchboard. George Craig. This is not appropriate. George, I want you to be the first to know. I've arranged the next one before midnight tonight. Reporting properly this time. Where are you? Let's meet. Give me your story. <gasps> one day, maybe. I'm counting on you, George. Mr. Craig, this is the last straw. Damn right. There's going to be another murder. Mr. Craig, will you please sit down? This disciplinary hearing has not been officially terminated. Well, it has. George has buggered off. Yeah. I'm sorry, but a disciplinary hearing once convened continues to sit. The Reform Party has served this country both in opposition and government. But never have we witnessed such a crisis in the nation's soul. Anyway, I don't want to seem picky, but when was the last time this party served in government? 1903. Good God. We were elected under the slogan, you know reform government works. And what happened? It didn't. Oh. Do you think my audience will remember 1903? Of course not, but it's the only way I could get reform party and government into the same speech. Fair enough. This is the true context of the bank manager murders. Those unlucky men were murdered, not as individuals, but as the unwitting agents of despair. A despair made all the harder because it followed a dawn of hope. A night last May of elation. The murdered bankers were the hapless victims of a country driven to a frenzy of frustration. Oh, it's good, Henry. It's very good. Good God. New tenant upstairs, Miss Sin, she calls herself. She's got little cards inviting lonely men to climb the walls of ecstasy. Oh. It can be damned hard going, the walls of ecstasy, Henry. I wouldn't know. Where was I? A frenzy of frustration. Right. The change of government achieved nothing. At last, national consciousness has been painfully aroused to an urgent and swelling desire for real action. You don't think we're condoning murder, do you? Oh, no, 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 we condemn the killings. But once we've done that, we can thrash the government with them till the cows come home. It'll knock them for six. Oh, oh, what a team, eh? Your brain and my mouth have got everything going for us. Except votes. You know, one day the people of this country are going to catch up with this party, and then what are we going to do? Run like hell, I'd say. Uh, God, I don't know how you can work here. Well, I'm going off to lunch. It's very good, Henry. It's really one of your very best. Can you get it over to the house by 3.30? You will have finished lunch, won't you? Of course. I'm due at dinner at 7. Cheerio! Bye, CP. Another tonight. That's all we need. That's what George said. He's got the call on some kind of recording. Why is he ringing George? It's just sure enough, isn't it? He wants publicity. I hope George isn't planning to give him any. If he does broadcast it, someone might recognise the voice. Yeah, the world and its wife. It's their ex-boyfriend, ex-husband, their boss's uncle's stepfather. it would take you a lot of months. And we can kiss goodbye to the serious work. Order us a pizza, will you, Mary? Deep pan seafood or something. So what else is there? We've got the follow-up on the people who saw Addison at Tooting on the morning he died. Charming geezer. In the morning, he called in five personal loans and wrote seven new letters. Saw three people in person, mortgage repossession, small business loan problem overdraft, unemployed bloke. Turned down the lot. Oh, uh, we can't track down that last one. It's an A. James. He was thrown out of the address the bank had for him six months ago. No love lost with any of the others. They uh, all seem quite in favour of the killer. I'm not surprised. If only he'd been bumping off estate agents, we might have had the public on our side. Eh, yeah, it's all pretty tenuous. Anybody could have walked into his office while the secretary was at lunch. Mary, no prawns. Have you heard there's a pop song about it? About murdering bank managers? It's doing very well. Oh, marvellous. So now we've got incitement on top of the pops. Keep looking for that fourth bloke, you never know. What else? We uh, turned up some names of account holders that crop up at more than one of the banks. Smiths and Whites, mostly. Check them, anyway. There's something to put in the file. Anything else? Just a silly thing. I heard an MP on the radio making a speech about Malthus. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it's a coincidence, but... Well, if we're looking for motives, the opposition are doing rather well out of all this, aren't they? <laughs> 
So this is bank manager gate, is it? Sure! Political conspiracy, add it to the list. We've got bugger all else, haven't we? And we have no idea where he might strike tonight. How about a bank? Madam Speaker, it may not be comfortable when a member rises unexpectedly, <laughs> but this member will not be denied. I say to this House, what this country needs is not words, but passion, and a powerful repeated thrust towards a new beginning of this country. Excellent speech, Jeffrey. Strong, passionate, almost. Was it? Thank you, Lord Turn. Is your speechwriter quite happy? Well, actually, I'm a little worried about him. He wants us to have policies. You're quite right. Can't just straddle the fence, can we? But I thought straddling the fence was what the Reform Party was all about. Then you get spiked where it hurts, as any hunting man would tell you. Anyway, times have changed. They've moved the fence, haven't they? We were always to the left of the right and the right of the left, right? Right. Now the Labour Party's moved to the right and the Tories have moved to the left, meaning we've been left altogether. I thought we were in the middle, as usual. No, because they're all in the middle. Meaning we either have to be the left or the right. Splendid opportunity, of course. To do what? To steal their clothes while they're bathing. Steal their clothes? That's what politics is about, stealing other people's clothes. Blair has stolen Major's clothes, Major stole Maggie's clothes. Did he really? So ask yourself, whose clothes would I like to steal? Any ideas, Lord Tone? One or two. And a daughter with lots. Knows where the 90s are at. And she wants a hobby. W what kind of a hobby? The politics. Something that will let her improve the world and be photographed by Hello magazine. Her name's Letitia. Doesn't need any money, of course. Wouldn't cost you anything. May I send her over? Well, yeah, why not? Henry's always saying... Was good, that. good man, Geoffrey. Hang on. I need the expiry date on your card. 1098. Good night. Right. Are you looking for me? <clears throat> no. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I mean, no. I'm looking to pay for... Bank, Jeremy Inchcape. I'm afraid business hours. Go to the window and look out. You should see something interesting. I beg your pardon? Just open the window and look out. Why would I do that? You'll learn something important. phone calls. I don't think he's your random loony. He's got a plan. Maybe he's covering something up. Maybe he's not on his own. Maybe that is overdraft cut off. 
What are you doing? Making sure my phone calls are recorded. You couldn't lend me a ten, could you? Max, for an economic analyst, you're amazingly bad at cash flow. Who isn't? Bloody bankers. I could murder them, George. George Cragg. Come on, sunshine. It's happened. He's gone up market. The Margot Polo Bank in St. James's. On my way. Oh, dear. Yeah, I'm really squeamish about the eyeballs. Place is tight as a drum, Gov. Uh, except for the open window. The window? Well, he must have gone to it. Leaned out like this. And being shot by the cycle from across the street. The phone here's off the hook. Go on, 1471. Ah, uh, no. Hey, hang on. There you go. This is the phone box. Mike, uh, nip down to the phone, will you, and have a sniff around? Yes, sir. Look, George, do you mind? Do you want to see this letter? All right. Dear manager, you appear to have lost your head for figures. The money man must die. Well, here's your bullet, Inspector. A pound coin fired with some adapted weapon. Cash on the brain, eh? He's consistent, anyway. No, I'll tell you what's not consistent. It's the first time I've seen a bullet to the head cause serious inflammation of the buttocks. His back end's red and sore. I need a post-mortem, but it's my guess that he's been caned fairly recently. Desk diary here, Gov. Appointment with M.S. Soho this evening. Looks like a regular arrangement. M.S. Could be Muz, one parent woman type. Come on. You make a lovely background atmos. So, maybe there's our link. <clears throat> In front of me, still warm, lies the body of Jeremy Inchcape. Manager of the Marco Polo Bank. He was shot through the head by a single pound coin and died instantly. His blood pouring all over his paperwork. Police have confirmed to me that a very dangerous person is at large and they ask all banks to remain vigilant. This is George Craig, hey, what a BBC scoop. Radio, St. James. All right, certainly colourful. The crimes are expected to play a big part in today's law and order debate in the Commons. The tiny reform party is likely to ask for a vote of confidence in the government's handling of the killings. Which are also causing disquiet in the city. As economist Dominic Dayath told the Today programme this morning. The crimes are affecting confidence in the city. Many see them as warning shots fired against the Bank of England's management of the entire bank. You got the back room, Squire? Oh, it's you, Frank. Don't fit in for a bit. Here. Got something in the till for you. Don't try that with me. Not today. Who's MS Saul? So... Marks and Spencers? Marshall and Snellgrove? Come on, Jed, you'll know what goes on around here. One of your bottom spanking fraternity. Sorority. Oh, well, discipline. It's your English vice, isn't it, Frank? Must be hundreds. No, uh, best you can do is go around the phone boxes, collect all the cards up. Except old BT will have been in there before, yeah? BT? Who's she? British Telecom. They clear them up. Very funny. Come on, Jed. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I bet you're on hide into nothing. I'm not in the mood. All right. Yeah. Try these. One day I'll come and take a proper look in your little back room. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Gov, they've got something off the computer checks. That bloke we couldn't find who saw Addison and Tooting the morning he died. There's an account in the same name at Battersea, too. Really? Get the team to investigate this lot. Uh, they won't like that. Yeah, yeah, pull the other one. It's got bells on. And let's find this bloke, OK? Get them out there and find him. Yeah, fine. What's that saying? It's just gone to the top ten. We've got to move. He's going to get cocky with all this attention. We've got to find him fast. Leader 
leader of the tiny reform party who made the most vivid contribution to yesterday's debate. Madam Speaker, this country is aching with frustration. Oh my God, I didn't. The public has an urgent need for good, hard policies which this government has failed to satisfy. The air is throbbing. Oh my God, damn. What am I going to do? Hello. Um, can I help in any way? I'm Letitia. Is there something I can do to help? I, um... I've come to work. My dad arranged it. And you are? Henry. Uh, Dad? Geoffrey Crichton Potter knows my father. Oh, and your father knows Geoffrey Crichton Potter? Uh, um, it's an old principle in politics. My father leads the party in the Lords. Oh, monotone. He is the party in the Lords. Oh, is that you call him? Oh, that's brilliant. I'll tell him. <laughs> no, no, no I, yeah, I want to keep my job. And what is your job exactly? A uh, speech writer, spin doctor, sandwich getter. Must be very clever. Look at this, though. Bit scruffy, isn't it? Designer distress is a bit passe, you know. Designer? <laughs> This is how the builders left it when they went off to the Napoleonic Wars. Well, Henry, all my talents are at your disposal. Just tell me what you want to do with me. Uh, morning, campers. Hello, Tisha. Hello, Jeffrey. Well, you two obviously met. Yeah. Mm. Good scoop, George. Great stuff, George. Yeah, it was. So what? You don't work here anymore, do you? Darling, if he keeps it up, it's the crime story of the 90s. And you know very well it's mine. You don't mean it, do you? I do if you keep calling me darling. OK, oysters and champagne to go. Box it up. Stick it in a cab to Soho, John. It's going to an A. James, right? Marvellous speech yesterday, Henry. That bank manager's staff had them cheering to the rafters. Brilliant. Quotes in loads of papers. Letitia's father thinks we ought to position ourselves if we're going to welly the ball for six right between the goalposts now it's in our court, as it were. I've been saying that for ages, CP. The problem with this wretched party is our two wings. Is it? But yeah, we've got our right wing who want to help people get rich and stay rich. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And then there's our left wing who want to redistribute wealth to promote social justice and aid the third world. Absolutely. First class proposition. So you agree with both of them? You want the rich to stay rich, but you also want to help the poor? Well, of course. Isn't that what all political parties want? Well, so they all say these days. And I'm sorry, CP, but it just seems to me totally symptomatic of the total profound intellectual confusion that's the defining characteristic of modern politics. Shouldn't be surprised. So, what next? We'll call it a lively internal debate and keep making speeches about something else. Oh, I'm sure you can come up with something, Henry. I'll put the kettle on. And we start with a law and order debate this afternoon. Quite a biggie. So what have you got for me? This is it. The murders are more than a shameful breakdown in law and order. They're a popular revolt against materialism. A weak government losing control. A climate of cynicism created by new labour. There's anxiety in the banking world leading to nerves in the city. We're on the brink of financial and social disorder. It's the old labour nightmare. That sort of thing. Sounds tremendous. Moustache, I've got lunch at White's. Or is it Boodles? There's a lady here from upstairs who's having trouble with her scion organiser. She's after a flop and I thought you might have one. Uh, no. Oh, I mean, yes. Only for an apple. An apple, right ho. <laughs> Guess what that Essex oik marshal has said to me this Lunch is for wimps. <laughs> I mean, what's the city coming to? First we're being stalked by some nutter. And now we're not supposed to stop for lunch. To get our strength up to fight him both. Nonsense. 
As a wise old banker once said, lunch is forever. <laughs> Hello there, Dominic. Yeah. <laughs> Heard you on the radio this morning about the murder business. Very good. Uh, this is De Aff, uh, brother oh, of Carstairs, as in Governor of the Bank of England. <laughs> Sadly, we do not choose our relations. <laughs> <laughs> Where's it all leading, eh, Dominic? Now, perhaps you should ask my more eminent brother. Oh. <laughs> In my view, he could be facing some very serious knock-on effects. Well, we all could, as financiers. Mm. So there's always lunch, eh? Wow! <laughs> bon appetit. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, how is the old governor? Waiter, you won't get the drinks. <laughs> Usual stuff. Uh, trouble over interest rates, worried about the pound. Well, these murders. Well, everyone's jittery. I mean, puts it all over the <laughs> Oswald, Dicky Oyster. <laughs> Not here, they don't have Dicky Oysters. <laughs> I'm swallowing something. My throat's burning. Steady on, Oswald. Let's have a nice drink of folly. I can't. Ozzy, Ozzy, come on. Somebody get an ambulance. Ozzy. <laughs> I think he's dead. What's this? George Cragg, Crown Correspondent. This is Hercules Fortescue, Mr. Cragg. I would be grateful if you would return to my office where I'm still waiting. Go away, Hercules. Much better, George. Your report today, it had colour. Who is it? You know who it is. I don't like to be called a maniac. What do you like to be called, then? A public servant. And you still haven't reported my names, George. Hercules Fortescue on the other line. Tell him to go stuff himself. What? Sorry. I've done it again, George. Why don't you visit the Barrow Boy and Banker and try the oysters? What have you done? Who to? I should hurry. Going for a double whammy. I'm planning a big contribution to the Lord's Water debate. I hope you appreciate it. He's done another. What the hell is he? I'm going to the Commons. I need to cover the Law and Order debate. No, it isn't, darling. Oh. Oh, Martin. Oh, Charles, thanks for the shoot the other day. Oh, not at all. We must get the guns out again sometime. Yes, indeed. And uh, we must talk further about the uh, DG. Remember how we were saying what a sad loss it would be if he were to go for well, some reason? Well, quite. Well, we must mourn that thought together in private in some way. Yeah, that's right. He's done another. Yeah. Excuse me. Tell Frank to get down to the Barrow Boy wine bar in the city. Fast, before some clever ass buggers up the evidence. And they're going to meet me at Westminster. I think there's something dodgy there. No. I don't know. Oh, Mr. Cragg, I knew you'd have to come through here eventually. Sorry, honey. Excuse me, but you are a member of staff and are therefore subject to the rules covering disciplinary procedure. Sit, and, Westminster. And, and, and the chairman's car. Look, get out of there. What do you think you're doing? I'm diverting resources into programme making. Cheerio. I put it to the Home Secretary that he has every responsibility for the bank manager murders because, Madam Speaker, the public think the murderer has a point. They voted for an end to government by bankers and accountants and what is the first thing that New Labour does? It throws the entire British economy into the hands of the Bank of England. <laughs> Madam Speaker, we in the Reform Party do not condone crime. But we put it to this House, what's a man to do? This government is driving its own citizens to murder! Over now, live to today's potentially explosive law and order debate. Our crime correspondent, George Craig, is at the Commons. George, how's the debate going? Q, George. Well, as you can hear, Richard, the law and order debate is turning into a vote of confidence for the Home Secretary. The opposition parties are really paying for blood here. And the voters! Yeah. Order! Order! The Home Secretary wishes to reply. I appeal to the House. No, you don't. <laughs> I can assure you this government remains tough on crime. Oh. We're doing everything in our power, everything in our power, to capture what is, after all, only one psychopathic killer oh. and bring it to justice. The leader of the Reform Party, Geoffrey Crichton Potter, has won startling support in the polls for his impassioned speeches on these murders. Blimey! What's CP's pager code? 
These murders will herald a collapse of social order. I have just been told that yet another murder has been committed in the heart of the city of London itself. Speaker, that's an outrageous question, and the honourable member should withdraw. This is a major embarrassment for a government at a time when their popularity is falling sharply. I will not withdraw. The Home Secretary's policies are in shreds. Why will not resign? I have no intention of resigning, and I'm assured of the full support of the Prime Minister. The scene in the house is remarkable. Members are on their feet. And there seems to be some sort of commotion on the government front bench. Well, we, uh, we seem to have lost our... George, what's happening? George! Run something else. I'm going down there. Max, Phil. According to this morning's Guardian, women's groups are demanding... <laughs> Peter Anson is a junior minister in the Home Office. Is he ill? Is that what he's no, he's not. He's dead. Oh, oh my God! God! What's happened? Looks like he's swallowed something nasty. Really? Oh, this is an outrage. Home Secretary, the government minister lies dead here in the house today. Can we have your comments, please? Bloody outrageous! Because the killer has struck at the very heart of government and murdered a friend and colleague. Because now we have to have another bloody by-election. It's a total and utter outrage.